All right, welcome. Um, it is 2.01 on Thursday, May 6th, and uh, welcome to the Northeastern IPM Toolbox Series. I am Jana Hexter, and I'm here with my colleague, Susanna Reese from the Stop Pest Program, and we are delighted to have two um, uh, guests with us who are going to share lots of information with you on reducing pest infestations in multifamily housing. It's a research update on mice and cockroaches. And uh, we're delighted to have you all here. And I see people are still coming in. If you've just come in, you haven't missed anything yet, so don't worry. All right, we are going to go through. Uh, okay. Um, so there is going to be a recording of this webinar. It'll be available in about a week on our website and you don't need to bother to try and write down this link because if you're registered for this webinar, I will send you an email uh, with a link to the recording once it's available. If you're from the state of Maine and you're seeking a pesticide applicator credit, please email Susanna at this link uh, with your name and license number, or you can reply to me. Um, I think I'm the one that automatically gets the emails from the Zoom link and I can forward them on to um, uh, Susanna. And you can also go to the stoppest.org uh, website for a certificate of completion and a PDF of the slides. And um, the slides will be posted along with the recording, so you'll be able to see that. And um, if you need to come back and find that URL that's on the screen right now, you'll be able to do that. Um, all right, we do welcome your questions. We have two Q&A breaks and um, our presenters have uh, generously offered to stay until 3.30 uh, to uh, ask, answer your questions if we have a lot, and I'm sure that we will from this presentation. Um, we do ask that you don't ask them in the chat. So it's much easier for us to keep track of the questions if you use the Q&A feature. So if you slide your mouse over your screen, you'll see the Zoom black bar either at the top or the bottom. And roughly in the middle of there, you'll see um, a Q&A box uh, with like two um, speaking uh, rectangles. And uh, if you click on there, you can ask a question. You can also do so anonymously, so you don't have to put your name on there. And that will allow uh, Susanna to keep track of all the questions to come in so that if five of you ask the same question, she can ask it once and, um, and it will allow us to be able to keep track better than using the chat feature. If you want to use the chat feature to put in a comment or to put in um, you know, a link maybe that you, that you think might be useful for someone, feel free to do that. Um, but the one that we're going to be monitoring is the Q&A. All right, oops, a daisy. Um, so I am delighted to uh, welcome our two presenters today, uh, Dr. Chang Lu Wang and uh, Shannon Sked. So Dr. Wang received as an extension specialist at Rutgers University, and his research interests are developing new and improved techniques and materials for urban pest management, ins insecticide resistance, and insect behavior. He's published six books or book chapters, 93 peer-reviewed papers, and 26 non-peer-reviewed articles, and he's co-authored uh, four patents. He's received numerous awards, including the New Jer Jersey Governor's Environmental Excellence Award in Healthy and Sustainable Communi Communities category in 2020. So thank you, Dr. Wang, for being with us today. And uh, Shannon Sked is a PhD candidate uh, working with uh, Dr. Wang. He was a Navy entomologist overseeing structural pests, specifically focusing on pests related to imports, exports um, within the logistics chain. He's more recently worked for Western Fumigation, overseeing pest management systems within international produce, commodity and equipment transportation. In 2017, he returned part-time to academia to pursue a PhD in entomology at Rutgers, focusing on spatial dynamics of economically important urban and structural pests, such as bedbugs and uh, commensal uh, rodents. So we have two uh, experts in the field with lots of information to share with you. And before we do that, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, so that we can give our presenters an idea of who is on the call and the kind of information that uh, you're already aware of. So you should see a poll in front of you, and I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes uh, to answer those poll questions. 
there are no right and wrong answers. This is not school. <laughs> it's simply for us to uh, have a sense of, um, of, the, of what people know when they're uh, starting this presentation. And I will be quiet for a minute while you do that. There is some people who can't see the poll on the screen. Uh, there's a certain um, interaction between Zoom and I think it's iPads of a certain era. So if you don't see it, don't panic, it's okay. And um, for the rest of you, I will give you some time to fill it out. Okay, and I'll be able to share the results with you. So the most effective way to identify pest infestations are monitors, uh, glue boards, monitoring stations, et cetera. This is uh, what the, the group think at the moment. And uh, which factor is uh, most often associated with the presence of cockroaches? Sanitation uh, beats out clutter. The most effective way to manage uh, cockroaches is a combination of chemical and non-chemical control methods. And um, which factor is most associated with the presence of mice? Access to the building um, is the vote at the moment. And uh, what's the most effective tool for eliminating mice? And the vote that wins the most just actually on this is uh, mechanical traps with chocolate spread. Uh, so we, with that, we're going to move forward and uh, we'll begin um, our presentation and Dr. Wang is going to speak first. Okay. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. Um, my name is Chang Lu Wang. Uh, thank you for attending uh, today's uh, meeting. I also thank uh, uh, Yana and uh, Susanna for inviting me today. Uh, today, I would like to uh, share some of our research findings about uh, cockroach management in apartment buildings. All right, so cockroach is a, a very common pest, you may know. So uh, in a recent study in four cities, we found uh, the number one pest is German cockroach, uh, which represented about 37% uh, of the apartment survey. The second most common pest was the mice. 16% of the apartments had mice, then followed by bed bugs. So you can see based on the high infestation rates, you know, we definitely need a better education or policies to manage the urban pests, especially the cockroaches. Among the cockroach infestations, uh, we found, uh, let me see who, slide moving. I uh, have to move the slide. All right, oh, sorry, I have to go back. So basically we found that uh, among the cockroach infestations, 98% were German cockroach. And then the rest are American and Oriental cockroach. So German cockroach is the dominant uh, species in the northern part of the US. But in the southern part, I think, I think it's still the number one pest, but uh, some other species may also present. Within the community and the between communities, the infestation rates can vary based on the characteristics of the residents, the pest control policies, and how buildings are maintained. Here I showed a, like a graph showing the eight different buildings in New Jersey. They were managed by a public housing authority and by a private company. Uh, you can see the infestation rate ranged from 10% to 49%. So this variation can be uh, you know, very common that uh, is related to a number of factors. Cockroach is a medically important pest. They can contaminate the food and the sterile equipment. Their feces, the skins, and uh, dead bodies are also um, contain large amount of allergens, which can cause sensitization and asthma. Uh, myself, after many years of working with cockroaches, I'm very sensitive to cockroach feces. I can feel the smell and feel the, uh, you know, the irritation from the cockroach smell. A study found that the cockroach allergy level is positively associated with the cockroach population density. 
blood one and blood two are the most uh, important allergens that are contained in the cockroach body and the feces. You can see that uh, as the cockroach counts increased, the concentration of these two allergens also increased. Most apartments have allergen levels that are above the threshold that can cause asthma. So therefore, it is very important to eliminate the cockroach infestations. When cockroaches are found in the home, residents usually look for pesticide products. For instance, the upper picture shows six different products were purchased by a resident to control cockroach infestations. Using pesticides can introduce additional health risks to the environment. And the ineffective use and improper use of chemicals can also be even more, effect, more uh, risky to the human health. Like uh, the picture shows below, the excessive use of boric acid dust is not only a waste, but it can cause potential harm to the residents and to the pets. When it comes to cockroach control, the first thing you should try is to use non-chemical control methods. This can include the sanitation. Sanitation is the most important environmental factor that can contribute to the cockroach infestation. You know, in the poll, about 61% of the people say the sanitation is most important. So indeed, sanitation is much more important than clutter because poor sanitation can provide food and water to cockroaches. Clutter can offer harbor size for cockroaches. Decluttering will help to control the cockroach infestations. Vacuuming, especially for heavy infestations, can remove a large number of live and dead cockroaches. So this is certainly a useful tool for reducing cockroach infestations. Trapping use glue board is a very effective method to detect and to actually reduce the number of cockroaches, especially when their numbers are very low. They are much more effective for detecting cockroaches than resident uh, say interview or based on complaints. So here I show the two pictures. The left one is a dirty apartment with a lot of utensils, a lot of items on the counter. Whereas on the right picture shows a very clean kitchen. So you can see in the apartment building, the variation of the sanitation condition is huge. But in our surveys, we only found about 10% of departments had a poor sanitation condition. So we shouldn't really uh, always complain about sanitation. It is one factor, but it's not the major factor. Um, have to move slides. Uh, Yana, can you help move the slides? Oh, I cannot. Oh, here, okay. Uh, so, Chang Lu, I think there's just some delay from the time that you click until the time that it moves. Okay, so, sorry. Okay. Uh, I have to go back. Yeah, it, it's uh, slower than I thought. And I can move them if it's easier. Uh, yeah, I will give up on my control and you can control it. Okay. All right, go move back. There we go. Yes, here. Right. So uh, when we do the cockroach monitoring, we usually place four traps in each apartment, one under the sink in the cabinet, one beside the stove, one beside the refrigerator, and one beside the toilet. If you have a larger, say, bedrooms, more, more uh, bathrooms, then you can place more traps. Then you can collect them after a few days or a few weeks. Next. So uh, when you find the cockroaches, it is often necessary to use a chemical treatment to eliminate the cockroaches because it's really hard for them to go away themselves. One of the chemicals that has been used for decades is boric acid. It's an inorganic insecticide. The mode of action is to 
uh, basically destroy the mid pattern layer of the insects. Uh, it's uh, relatively effective, uh, low toxicity, and low cost. Uh, the only disadvantage is that uh, it's a slow acting and may leave a white uh, you know, residue on the surface, so it may not be attractive in certain environments, but it's still a very effective chemical. But uh, you have to apply it uh, very thoroughly around perimeters in cracks, crevices, and also avoid the over application, such as the lower right picture. I go ahead, move. So this is an over application because when you apply a thicker layer of the dust, it can actually become repellent. It's also a waste of the materials. This is the area behind the refrigerator area, which uh, often harbor a large number of cockroaches. So treating this area is important, but uh, avoid the over application. Next. Aeros aerosol spray is the most commonly used product by consumers. Reed, ant, and cockroach spray is especially popular. We found about uh, at least 50% of the residents who tried to control cockroaches use the reed and ant uh, spray for cockroach, uh, which is amazing. But unfortunately, this is not an effective product because most of the field cockroach populations develop the resistance to pyrethroids, which are the common active ingredients contained in this kind of products. The second uh, uh, product type is uh, uh, foggers. So foggers actually are completely useless. In a study recently published by North Carolina State University, they found uh, the four foggers listed here, the hot shot and the red foggers are completely ineffective in controlling cockroach infestations. Next. Uh, next. So uh, what they found is uh, total release foggers failed to reduce cockroach populations, whereas gel base caused the significant declines in the cockroach populations. In addition, using foggers resulted in significant pest deposits throughout the kitchen. So definitely you do not want to use the foggers for cockroach control. As a matter of fact, it's not effective for bed bugs and spiders either. Next. The most effective product for cockroach control is gel base. There are many different kinds of gel base available. Uh, it's wise to select at least three different kinds of baits with different uh, active ingredients so that you can avoid the resistance management, uh, resistance development. Plus, uh, how you apply this bait is equally important uh, you know, for effective control of infestations. Next. When we do the cockroach uh, control, we usually apply the bait systematically. So you basically go from one side to the other side. Every cabinet, you have to apply the bait to all the corners of the cabinets, take out the drawers, use a flashlight to guide the treatment. If you find the feces, live roaches, then you have to apply bait to that area. The amount of bait and the number of places you apply will correlate uh, with the population levels. That's why you use uh, monitors to determine where the cockroaches are hiding and how many cockroaches are present. Next. So these are two additional pictures showing where we apply the bait. Next. Sometimes you have to actually stick your head into the cabinets in order to find where the cockroaches are hiding and uh, apply the bait directly into the harborage where the cockroaches are hiding. Next. You know, cockroaches are notorious for its ability to develop a resistance. Therefore, when applying pesticides, always try to design the treatment schedule so that uh, you prevent the resistance development. There are several methods for resistance management. First is to rotate the chemicals with different uh, mode of action. 
such as for gel base, you can use fipronil, endoscarb, dinotefron. All of these bases are very effective. Second, yes, next. Our second method is, is to use a combination of a different control methods, such as you may use a combination of boric acid dust, gel bait, and insects, insect growth regulator. So this is especially useful when you control heavily infested environment. Next. And lastly, use IPM, so integrated pest management. Next. So for concrete IPM, it consists education of the clients, monitoring using groupers, use effective materials, and the evaluation. All of them are important because education can help you gain collaboration from the clients. So you can have a better environment to control and you help reduce the cockroach population. Using groupers will help you determine which apartment or which area you need to treat and whether the cockroaches are eliminated. Using effective materials, of course, is very important. And finally, you have to evaluate so follow up treatments until elimination is very important so that uh, you get rid of the cockroaches after the treatments. Next. And before I go to the next slide, I see a couple of questions have come in yes. on the chat and someone raised their hands. So okay. if you have a question, please use the Q&A feature and um, we'll be stopping for some questions at the end of uh, Chang Lu's presentation. Okay. okay. Oh, it's here. <laughs> Uh, do you want to have a question now or later? Uh, no, I, we have some time for some questions. And Susanna, do you have uh, seen any questions come through? Sorry, I couldn't unmute for a second. Um, OK, uh, a couple questions that came through that I think were good questions. Sam Bricks, our IPM specialist from Canada, pointed out that in some places in Canada, boric acid is um, banned because it can um, uh, it's not safe for pets um, not here in the US that I know of but he asks about what about diatomaceous earth and silica for cockroaches um, boric acid is more effective than diatomaceous earth dust uh, the diatomaceous earth or DE dust uh, are more likely to lose the efficacy plus uh, it's a main uh, mode of action is dehydration, you know, absorbing the uh, lipid layer of the or wax layer of the insects. Uh, I never see people using DE dust for cockroach control. Uh, silica gel uh, is lighter, uh, has same mode of action as DE dust. Uh, nobody done this test before. Uh, I think uh, it's also most likely less effective than boric acid. Uh, I'm not sure why boric acid is banned in uh, Canada. It's still actually here, widely used by residents, at least. Mm -hmm. um, Paul asks, uh, in your recommendation of vacuuming live and dead cockroaches, would you also recommend disposing the vacuum bag after cleaning? How do you recommend cleaning a vacuum to avoid cross-contamination? Uh, depends on the purpose. If you use a uh, vacuum machine with a HEPA filter, filter supposedly um, this risk of recirculation of the allergens into the air is low. However, if you're concerned about, uh, you know, if you vacuum the larger number, a larger amount of debris, uh, dead roaches, then you may want just to dispose the uh, container and rinse it, or if it's a reusable, you know, vacuum container. Oh, I have the question of the hour. You mentioned that education is key. How do you educate residents without offending them? I'm not sure anybody has the answer, um, but I would just, before I turn it over to you guys, if you have any ideas, on the stoppest.org website, we have a whole section on working with residents with some tips and um, uh, tools. Uh, but also, Cheng Lu mentioned that um, Sanitation isn't an issue in every cockroach infestation. Yeah, we found that I will discuss later that the sanitation is important, but not uh, the deciding factor. You can still eliminate uh, most of the infestations. 
uh, in one of our study, we treated 94 apartments, uh, 93 of them no longer have roaches after complete, after we repeatedly sampling for two months, no roaches found. So only one apartment, uh, we couldn't get rid of the roaches because uh, that uh, resident was religious. She, he had food in every room, every closet, and also has water. So that is very important. Uh, in terms of education, we found that uh, uh, really, uh, I think the in-person education is very effective. If you are doing control, you tell them here, you want to say, get rid of this, uh, remove the food or water from this area, then they are more likely to cooperate and then get a good results. Uh, also, um, uh, basically you, you have to have a personal in interactions sometimes in order to get the desired results. But it's not a very critical, I would say. Um, Richard Berman brings up an important point. Uh, Peer-to-peer -peer education, involve a community group, residents advising residents, recruiting a resident that could be your um, liaison, I think is a very effective uh, tool and offering food at meetings too. <laughs> yes, we have uh, seminars that uh, offer uh, snacks uh, and more people attended. So yes, peer, peer education is important in that uh, uh, they listen to their neighbors. So if their neighbors say, oh, uh, gel beta is better than spray, and you know their friends or neighbors are made more likely to use gel beta rather than sprays. Right. I think maybe it's a good time to move on right. to uh, okay. Shannon's presentation. And um, yeah. there's a few more. Uh, Chang Lu has some more slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. Slide. Sorry. Okay. So Sorry. here I draw so, uh, briefly because uh, the timing. I have to uh, go through very fast. So mm -hmm. I want to go through this uh, comparison study to uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of a BUNY-wide IPM program. This was done in Patterson, New Jersey. Next. So first building had 188 apartments. Most of them had a one bedroom, uh, one, basically one bedroom. Next. The second building also consisted of one bedroom apartments. There were a total of 14 floors, 112 apartments. Next. So in both buildings, we conducted a building-wide inspection by laying four traps and then pick them up after two weeks. Next. So the traps were examined and the number of cockroaches were counted. The number of counts per trap ranged from one to 484. So it's a very you know, big difference. In the first building, 49% of departments were infested. In the second building, 47% of departments were infested. So they have very similar rate of infestation and all had a very high number of you know, departments with roaches. Next. Uh, in the first building, we mapped the distribution of the infestations so we can have a visual you know, account of where they are located. Uh, you can see that uh, the infestations are clustered. For instance, on the 13th floor, the left room, six apartments, do not have infestation. But on the right wing, all the six apartments were infested. And if you look at uh, you know, 13th floor, uh, 12 and 11th floor on the right side, all of the apartments were infested. So this means when an apartment is infested, it's a neighboring unit, whether sharing a wall, cross the hallway, or sharing the ceiling, will be more likely to be infested. This is very important why we want to continue, we want to con concentrate on building-wide IPM. Otherwise, the cockroach will continue to spread among the joining units. Next. The initial treatment uh, consisted of applying bait and also the boric acid dust in apartments with more than 20 cockroaches. Next. Then we sent a one page flyer to residents. When we did the control, we also asked the residents to keep the apartments clean, do not use any sprays. Uh, 
next. The common areas also had cockroaches. This is very important that uh, when you do cockroach monitoring and control, do not forget the common areas, such as compact room, laundry room, boiler room, and the committee room. All of them actually had roaches during our survey, and we treated them. Next. The garbage disposal room or the compact room is the most uh, difficult to control because uh, here I always had garbage and uh, uh, cockroach and other pests, both were present. So in this area, we end up uh, using a combination dust, spray, and the base together to get rid of cockroaches and also the flies. Next. Over the period of one year, we use the four different uh, base to control cockroach infestations. Next. So overall, we found that uh, the level of the infestation would uh, correspond to the amount of bait that is needed and also the number of treatments that is needed. So basically, the higher number of the cockroaches, then you have to use more bait and uh, more number of treatments. So that's why that uh, you know monitoring the cockroaches, detect early, treat early, will save time and save materials. Next. So overall, we found that in the IPM building, the infestation rate reduced from 49% to 12% after one year. Next. And then in the control building, which was managed by the uh, existing pest control contractor, which they visited the building monthly uh, just do the regular, you know, uh, general pest control. The infestation rate reduced from 47% to 29%. The IPM treatment was much more effective compared to the conventional treatment methods. And next. We also found that uh, during the six months building wide survey, 54% of the residents were unaware of the presence of cockroaches. Well, they have cockroaches. At the 12 months, this percentage is even higher. 88% were unaware of the presence of cockroaches. This is because you know, when the cockroach numbers are low, many residents just didn't find them because cockroaches are nocturnal and many, many people didn't notice they have roaches. Next. The IPM treatments are not only effective for reducing cockroach infestations, they can also significantly reduce the cockroach allergen levels. We sampled the floor dust in the apartments at the beginning and at the 12 months, at six months and 12 months. So we found that both blood G1 and the blood G2 allergen levels reduced to very low levels. Next. Uh, so 0 0.4 basically is below the uh, asthma risk level. So which means uh, uh, you wouldn't uh, have the risk of asthma if you live in the environment below uh, at this level. Next. We also sampled the floor dust to measure the insects residues in the bedroom and the kitchens. Next. So before treatment and after treatment, you can see that uh, uh, both the residue levels in the bedroom and the kitchen reduced significantly. So from 9.3 to 3.3 in the bedroom and in the kitchen from 11.9 to 2.2. Next. So overall, there was 74% reduction in the insecticide residues. Next. So IPM is definitely uh, preferred and more effective, but however, how much it will cost. We had a publication in 2009 to evaluate uh, the cost and the effectiveness of community-wide IPM programs. So this was done in Gary City in Indiana. We selected uh, two communities. They have uh, only about uh, one or, or one or two-story buildings. So basically, we uh, use the same treatment protocol 
but the one community was serviced by researchers. The other, the other community was serviced by a contractor. Next. So after 12 months period, we found both the entomologist delivered IPM and the contractor delivered IPM resulted a 74% reduction in the number of invested apartments. The entomologist delivered IPM caused a faster reduction because the contractor didn't follow the protocol exactly at the very beginning. So now you can see that uh, as long as we follow the IPM protocol, we can get a very good results after one year. Next. So the cost based on this study was $7.50 per apartment per month. This was based on $60 per hour labor rate. I think the labor rate at present is much higher. Suppose we use $120 per hour rate, then the cost for the monthly treatment would be about uh, maybe $15 per apartment per month. Now this is very high compared to many contracts currently adopted by housing authorities. But uh, keep in mind that uh, this is only for one year. I'm sure that the future cost will be much lower because you would have much lower number of investitions. Plus considering the benefit of reduced pest residues and also reduced alien levels. Next. Uh, next. So in summary, we found that uh, IPM are highly effective in eliminating cockroach infestations, but a thorough placement of bait and spending sufficient time on, uh, based on the infestation level is the key to success in the cockroach elimination. Next. So low cost cursory monthly service is not very effective in reducing the infestation rates. And next. And the building-wide monitoring using traps is very important for detecting cockroach infestations. And next, uh, elimination of infestations can still be achieved even with limited client cooperation. I often heard that people complain about uh, you know, some poor sanitation, but I want to say that uh, a good uh, pest control policy or program is more important in many cases to eliminate the infestations. Next. Uh, finally, I want to mention a book that uh, I just published uh, this month. Uh, it's about the biology and the management of the German cockroach. It's available online. Uh, it's cost a lot, but uh, I think that there will be a discount code sometimes you may find. Uh, this was edited by me and uh, Chao Yang Li and uh, Michael Rust from University of California, Riverside. Uh, next, I think that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, what I suggest we do is move on to Shannon's uh, presentation, and then we'll uh, take some questions at the end for both uh, Dr. Uh, Wang and for Shannon, because I know some people um, may have to leave right at the top of the hour, and that will give you enough time to hear what Shannon has to say. All right. So, Shannon, if you want me to take over the slides, let me know. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Can you hear me all right, Jenna? Yes. All right. All right, so I'm gonna go over um, two parts of a study that we did that was funded by Northeast IPM. It's related to the house mouse. We'll do a switch from six legs to four legs now. And, uh, and it's specifically it's management and distribution in multifamily settings. So the first thing is, um, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's really important to understand because a lot of the work that I'm going to present here is actually focused on distribution and movement. And um, there's actually quite a bit of research that goes in. I took about eight um, pieces of, of research to kind of put this, this story together and, and really understanding what a deem is and what a nest is, is critically important for understanding the way that house mice move, um, especially in multifamily units. So the DEEM is that tight social network. Um, a lot of people will use DEEM and NEST interchangeably, but the DEEM is specifically about the network within that NEST. So the way that the different individuals and you know, their pecking order and the way that they're set up, the way that they interact with each other, um, it can be very small. It could be as small as two meters um, and DEEMs will kind of overlap and interact. So it could be extensively large as well. 
but this is what sets all the behaviors that we're going to be talking about. And then there's this, this concept of a nest. So the deem is the social structure and the nest is the physical location. And there are various ways that they will move based off of what type of role they play behaviorally um, within that deem. So for example, there's these exploratory scouts. These are the young males. They usually go out much further than what we typically think of than you know, 15 to 30 meters is typically what you would think uh, uh, individuals within a deem would move out away from their nest. Exploratory scouts can move out upwards of 100 meters from, from their location as well. So it's, it's quite large. Um, and then there's this other thing that we don't see all that often, but it is a part of the population dynamics where you have this mass casualty event that could take place where all of a sudden, all the individuals start dying off quickly. It has to do with them actually reaching their resource limitation. So we call that a carrying capacity. Basically what it means is all of a sudden there's a limitation on food, on space, on availability, and usually it's disease driven. So there's some type of catastrophic disease event that takes place. However, Bobby Corrigan did a lot of work on this and found that you know the human driver of, of resources actually limits this. So we don't see this all that often in house mice. We do see this in feral populations quite often. We see it in paradomestic mice, things like deer mice, but we don't see it all that often in house mice. And the reason why is because we are constantly uh, offering more resources to them. So that's something really important to understand as we think about the way that they move. So let's talk about what I'm gonna be going over with the first part of this study. The objectives are pretty simple. We wanted to have an understanding, are residents' complaints reliable? for indicating whether or not there's a house mouse infestation. Um, we wanted to compare the effectiveness of, of novel non-toxic baits for detection. And then we wanted to do some mice specific in apartment base placement. So in other words, if I put a bait in, next to the stove versus next to the sinks, next to versus other areas, is that gonna have an impact or is that important? And then finally, what aspects of integrated pest management on house mouse management is really effective for long-term impacts? So we will start. We'll start with um, what we did. So we did a building-wide inspection. Uh, we basically we did this in in two buildings, uh, one in Trenton with 246 units, one in Linden with 200 units. We conducted questionnaires to residents. Basically, pretty simply, have, do you have mice or have you seen mice or not? And then we installed two monitors and we left those monitors in place for a week. Inside each one of those monitors, there were blank baits and chocolate dollops, chocolate spread dollops. Um, so the blank baits were the um, uh, comparative, they were commercial, so they were comparative to two that do have rodenticides in them. Um, and then the chocolate dollops had no rodenticides. So nothing here had rodenticide, this was just for detection. From that, um, these were the, the places where we, you could start to see where we put the baits. So for that first part where we did the monitoring, we put one bait in the kitchen area and one bait in the family room area next to the HVAC center. For those apartments where we did find mice, which in Trenton building, we found 19 apartments that had active feeding. In Linden, there was 49. We then installed three bait stations. And in those bait stations, we switched out the blank baits with rodenticide baits. And then we returned four times on week six, seven, nine, and 11 to weigh and replace to see how much feeding we had and, and where we were finding any type of elimination. On the 11th week, we removed the rodenticide and then we repeated the same building survey. We actually did that again on month six and month 12. So there was a grand total of four building wide sweeps where we went into every apartment that we had access to. And then there was four times that we actually in between there where we had rodenticide treatment taking place. That's kind of the way it was set up in, in a short, sweet way. So let's answer the first question. Are residents' complaints reliable? Well, it turns out they're not. And, and this isn't any big surprise because we saw the same thing with some of the other work that was done uh, out of the lab um, that Chang Lu did for bed bugs and for cockroaches. Um, 18 apartments with residents that, that had, we were able to, thought that they had mice, that they answered yes. 56% of them, we didn't find any feeding activity. Among the 19 apartments where there were mice, only 42% were aware of it. So this was specific for the Trenton one, but we actually saw this replicated in also the Linden building as well as two other ones, which weren't part of our analysis here. And then when we asked the question, well, is the effectiveness of non-toxic baits, is the type of bait that you use important? It turns out it is. Um, chocolate spread is novel uh, non-toxic bait. 
was fed upon the most. As a matter of fact, we saw that they started feeding upon more and more chocolate as time went on and less and less on the, on the blank rodenticides, the commercially available rodenticides. In our case, the Lifitec actually was consumed more than the DTEX. However, I want to be really careful about this because uh, mouse feeding behavior is actually really, really complex. It's based off of pheromones, learned behaviors, and genetics. So in these studies, we did find this, but this doesn't mean that you're going to see that same effect uh, between different baits in all buildings throughout wherever you are. Location effect, I think, was the part that was really interesting to me. Um, what we did see is in the Trenton location, we did find a location effect. The stove was predominantly the, 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 the place where we, we had a bait station that was most actively fed upon. In Linden, we didn't see that effect at all. When we dug into this a little bit, we started taking a look at the construction, it started making sense. If you notice on the top one in the Trenton location, you'll see that the HVAC which is uh, the, the uh, ventilation, air conditioning, and heating system, was actually, in, in the Trenton location, it was a closed duct system, so it was forced hot air, whereas down in the Linden location, it was actually a baseboard heat system, which basically requires a hot water pipe to actually go through the wall, which allows access. You can see here, we actually had more feeding relative in the Linden location than we did in the Trenton location. So it actually isn't necessarily a specific location is most important, but when you think about where baits, uh, bait stations need to be placed, you have to consider the building construction and think about that in terms of the way that mice move throughout a building. In this case, with the baseboard heaters, being that it allowed an access way for mice to, to, to go through, we did see an uptake in feeding by the HVAC uh, stations. Did we have any impact on IPM? We did. Um, we actually saw a reduction. I, I didn't mention it in the materials and methods, but we actually worked with both property management groups and we went through all the apartments where we did have activity and actually gave them a list of here are the things that we see that are exclusionary in nature, here's sanitation issues. Um, and, and out of that work, along with the rodenticides, we did see a reduction in feeding activity on those that originally were identified as being active from the time of the start of the treatment to the end of the treatment. However, and this one was a little bit of a surprise. When we actually did the statistical analysis on this, we actually found that individual apartment sanitation and clutter was not important. <laughs> that was really a surprise because we always think that if you have a clutter, dirty apartment that has a lot of food availability, that's where you're gonna see mice. It turns out that, yeah, there, there is that trend, but it, what's more important is actually the building-wide sanitation, uh, including the trash compactor and, and the rooms where the trash chutes go down as well as exclusion, specifically on the ground floors. We did uh, spatial analysis on this, looking at the lower levels, the first three levels versus all the floors above. And that was statistically significant. In other words, if you're on one of the lower levels, you're more likely to have house mice. Well, that's because it's the access area. It's the outer envelope that was, that was more important than individual sanitation and flooding. Finally, on the lower, uh, this is what I was just mentioned, on the lower three floors, we did have more feeding activity than what we saw on the upper floors. And this was true on both of these buildings in this study, as well as two other buildings that we then evaluated later, looking, doing a spatial analysis, which I'm gonna show you in part two a little bit. So the conclusion, resident complaints are not a reliable indicator of infestations. Um, really building-wide monitoring is the way to go in order for us to find where those apartments were on the first month, the sixth month, and the 12th month, we actually had to do a building-wide monitoring event each and every time. Uh, comparative effectiveness of non-toxic food baits for detection. Well, in our case, chocolate spread, which we've seen this in, in a lot of other studies as well, chocolate spread actually seems to be really well preferred versus commercial baits. Um, in our case, we saw Lifitec be more uh, preferred than DTEX for feeding. However, that's not something that we, we would expect to see in all environments because of the the complexity of bait preference. Mice do occur more often in certain locations in an apartment. So understanding that building construction becomes really important. It's not as simple as just putting something out saying that there's a standard. Um, in every event, you should put your bait next to the stove. In every event, you should put your bait next to the, the refrigerator. In every event, you should put the bait next to the HVAC system. You really have to think about your construction and the way that mice are using inner envelope to actually navigate throughout the building. The most important aspect that we found was the building-wide exclusion. 
for long-term management. When we went back on month six and month 12, those, those um, properties that actually have followed the exclusion list that, that we put together, the recommendation list of exclusion practices, actually had very, very low rates of reinfestation. Those property management uh, buildings that did not follow all of those exclusion, we still saw, actually in some cases, we saw a higher rate of infestation when we returned a year later. So I'm gonna go through this second part relatively quickly. This is the spatial movement, and I will be going through these slides, um, hopefully a little fast, depending on the lag when I, when I go to, to switch them out. Um, this was actually pretty simple. This was just to understand movement within buildings, which is something that I think is really interesting because if we can actually figure out the way that they move, we can actually do a little bit more targeted IPM. And actually that'll help reduce chemical exposures that aren't necessary, as well as a lot of other activities that we do. So what we did for this is we took the same data set that I just showed you in, in part one, those same two buildings. We added two other buildings that we did uh, research on in Patterson. And then we did a modeling event, um, looking at whether or not if, if there was a neighbor, or, uh, I'm sorry, if there was an apartment that had an active feeding infestation of house mice, do their neighbors that don't have feeding currently, are they more at risk of actually having house mice, less at risk or no risk? And so um, by, by doing four replicates, we were able to actually uh, come up with some pretty good conclusions here. Now, I'm gonna take you through one example here just to show you the way that feeding occurred. And what you'll see here is this is actually a floor layout of the entire building of one of, of, one of the uh, uh, buildings that we did uh, study at. This is the Trenton location. And what you can see here is those that are in gray are, are locations where we, when we did the original building sweep, we had no feeding activity. Those units that are in pink, we had feeding on both the chocolate and one, at least one of the commercial baits, if not both of them. If it's in blue, it was just on the bait, the commercial bait, so no chocolate feeding. And if it's brown, it was just on chocolate. Now, if it's white, there was no feeding. And what we see as we go through is you see, we start to see a reduction in the total amount of units where there's feeding. So that means that the rodenticides are starting to work. You see more of a reduction, but you'll notice as I'm going through, you'll start to see less and less of the pink and the blue units and more and more of the brown units. There was actually a switch where they were feeding on chocolate as well as commercial baits or just commercial baits. And they were going over and starting to feed on the chocolate more. And you can see that there's actually some returns. In this case, it, on this bottom end unit located right here, this was one where we actually had an eradication event and then it returned two weeks later. We had more returns as we kept on going on, but you'll notice that in each one of these returns, they were only feeding on the chocolate, not on the uh, commercial rodenticide. And this kept on going on and on until finally we got to the end of the study. Now, what one of the things that we found here was that out of the five uh, events, so we looked at this for the zero month, the initial building sweep, and then one year later, out of each one of those events for all four buildings, so a grand total of eight, there was one time that we could not do the statistics on this because there wasn't enough activity for us to say whether or not there was a, a nearest neighbor uh, causation. However, out of the other seven that were remaining, five of them actually showed that there is a near neighbor effect. In other words, if your neighbor has uh, active feeding of mice, the chances that you're gonna have active feeding mice in your apartment is actually increased. So it's likely. I will say on the second building in Patterson where we were not able to determine it, we actually did see the trend. It wasn't statistically significant. Part of the reason why we think that might have been the case is because there were not many units that had shared walls. In this building, there was a lot of units where there was a stairwell between or maybe a window between or, or a foyer or something, an elevator. Um, so they didn't have as many shared wall events for us to be able to actually find that difference. So the conclusions here is, out of 16 units where the feeding ceased, six of them had incidents where feeding returned. So just because you eradicate a house mouse infestation in one apartment doesn't mean that the house mouse infestation is gone. As a matter of fact, it's very likely that it'll return to that apartment at some later time unless house mouse management is done building wide. The most important aspect of what we saw was that outer and inner envelope exclusion. So it's actually making sure that that building is tightly sealed and that the building-wide sanitation, including the trash compactor, is, is done well. Lastly, having a neighbor with an active mouse infestation will put an apartment at a higher risk. 
I'd like to thank Northeast IPM Center for the uh, funding for this research. I thought it was really interesting and it actually brought about some information that I don't think that we've seen before, so it was really good. And of course, our team at the, the Rutgers Entomology Urban IBM Laboratory, um, you can't imagine the hours that it took to, to put this whole thing together and go knock on all the doors of all these apartments. So uh, it, it took a collaborative effort and there were a lot of people involved. So I'm really grateful for those people. And with that, I think uh, that's all I've got. Wonderful. Um, so we're, before we go on to the questions, what we're going to do is uh, ask you some poll questions so the follow up from the beginning, and then uh, we'll spend some time um, with, uh, with uh, answering some of your questions. So you should see the a poll. Most of them are very similar questions that we asked in the beginning. And uh, then we'll probably ask uh, Chang Lu to, to go over the correct answers, uh, just in case, so you know. So I'm just going to give you two minutes to do that. And um, if you uh, missed the poll in the beginning, don't worry, you can still take it now. And for those of you who don't see the poll on your screen, you probably have a um, um, you probably have an iPad that has problems seeing the seeing the polls. So I'll just be quiet for a couple of minutes, and so you can answer that, and then we'll answer some of your questions that have been coming up. I'll mention while folks are filling out the poll, this is the Stop Pest website I mentioned where you can find other um, resources on IPM for affordable housing. And I put some resources uh, related to this webinar. Um, they'll be on my, this website and the Northeastern IPM uh, website. And you can navigate to directly uh, to the site with the certificate of completion, the PDF of the slides. That's stoppest.org slash go slash IPM update. Um, or you can just navigate there through the homepage at stoppest.org. There's a number of ways you could find the webinar. Great, and we'll just give it uh, 25 more seconds and then we'll close up the poll and uh, we'll share the results with you. So. We appreciate you taking the time to do this. It helps us a lot. So, and there are no right and wrong answers. Well, there are right and wrong answers in this, but <laughs> you're not being graded is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, it's purely informational for us. So. Great, okay. So I will end the poll now and um, so we will see that 77% uh, um, uh, of people are going, oops, I'll, oh, there we go, thank you. 77% um, of people are going to use or promote the use of uh, monitors and, um, and folks already have been doing that anyhow. Um, the most effective way to identify pest infestations is monitoring, is this correct, Chang Lu? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, which factors most uh, often indicate the presence of cockroaches? And that is sanitation over clutter. Is that correct? Right. All right. You're doing well, folks. Okay. The most effective way to manage cockroaches is the combination of chemical and non-chemical control methods. Yes, correct. Yes. And um, which factor often is most associated with the presence of mice? Access to the building. That's correct, Shannon? Correct. All right, and the uh, most effective tool for eliminating mice is mechanical traps with chocolate spread. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, and, um, and uh, folks have said that they are extremely likely to uh, increase their use of IPM after this webinar, which warms the cockles of our hearts. So, um, so with that, um, I will... Uh, I will move forward and um, and um, I want to let's go back and actually answer some questions uh, so I can maybe move the slides back. There we go. So Susanna, do we have some questions or comments that have come in? Yeah, Chang Lu, thank you for helping me answer these. It was really helpful. There are some that I think should be repeated out loud, though. There was a little bit of confusion about how the, co the chocolate spread was used, um, what kind of spread and I think people didn't quite clearly understand that the chocolate spread was just used for monitoring, but how could you use the chocolate spread um, 
to control mice. It was, there's a little, sure. the question was, were rodenticides incorporated into the chocolate spread? Uh, how and what did you incorporate? But Cheng Lu answered that, but I think uh, it should be answered for everybody because there was a couple questions on that. So the idea was pretty simple in, in all honesty, and it really wasn't about, I, I, and don't get me wrong, chocolate spread does, I mean, because it's, it's worked on multiple studies that we've done. Uh, so we think that it's, it's a little bit um, ubiquitous, but it is, it, it, it wasn't so much about the chocolate spread or the two different types of commercial baits that were used. We did not use rodenticide in the chocolate spread. That's the first answer. It was basically just for monitoring. And the reason why we had it in, even when we had rodenticides in place, was because we saw such a preference for the chocolate spread. We were curious, were we going to get feeding on the chocolate spread and not the rodenticide? And we did. Um, so what the, the point here is, is that if you use a single um, taste, uh, taste bait, food bait, and that's all you're using to make your decision as to whether or not there's mice, how you're tracking mice or anything like that, it's probably not enough. Um, in other words, you got to use multiple different types of baits um, and try different things out because of this complex learned behavior of, of, of palatability. Um, and this complex genetics and, and, and also the pheromone uh, communication that mice exhibit, using just one bait, you might put it out, they might get used to it, stop feeding on it, or it may not be attractive to begin with, and you think that everything is okay. And it turns out you're just not used, you're not finding them because they're not feeding on it. So using multiple baits in, in a bait station to determine whether or not there's actually mouse activity is the right way to go for detecting mice. And if you are a property manager and you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, I don't put the baits down, knowing that, you know, knowing this information, you can advocate for better um, management with your pest management company. Um, let's see. Oh, th this is a good question, too. Um, uh, Kimberly mentioned that the neighbor theory, the the. More, you're more likely to have rodents or mice in a home where your neighbor has, when there's a neighboring apartment with an infestation, she asked, does the same apply to cockroach infestations? I think that's important to highlight. Chang Lu, you've done that work previously, correct? Sorry, which one? Yeah, <laughs> Chang Lu, you answered this question already on the Q&A, but when you have a, uh, an infestation of cockroaches, are you likely to have a neighboring apartment that also has an infestation? Uh, yes, yes. So I sent a reply to one person. We published the paper showing that uh, when one apartment is infested, the neighbor that is sharing the wall, sharing the ceiling or the floor, all across the hallway is more likely infested. Uh, that's because uh, the common plumbing or other utility pipes will be the highway for cockroach to spread. Also, cockroaches can spread across hallway. Someone asked what kind of chocolate spread works, and uh, Cheng Lu answered Hershey's, but any brand would work. Um, and a, a couple of people asked where this, where these studies were published. Um, I, I think the easiest way that I always search for publications from uh, Dr. Wang is I just type in. Chang Lu Wang publications and look on his uh, Rutgers uh, bio page and it lists all these studies. Um, and then back to cockroaches, somebody asked, and I get this question a lot, so I think it bears repeating, the trash compactor room, uh, you know, combining baits and sprays, are you gonna contaminate the baits? How do you recommend uh, treating trash compactor rooms? Uh, the question was related to cockroaches. Oh, uh, okay, so this one, uh, actually, you have to apply different uh, chemicals, uh, I guess, uh, in different uh, areas. Uh, for instance, we first do a visual inspection to find out where the cockroach is hiding. Then we only apply the bait to the cockroaches where they're hiding. Then we apply the spray to areas where the flies tend to land. And then we apply the boric acid dust around the perimeters of the compact room. So we ended up uh, used the uh, dust, gel bait, and spray, three different, different formulations to control the cockroach infestations. But eventually we'll get rid of the cockroaches. So it was very successful. 
Okay, and uh, there's a couple more questions we can, um, if you didn't get your question answered, we can uh, connect privately. I'm thinking we got most of the questions, the relevant questions answered. Um, there's a question about termites, which I would encourage you to give me an email privately. Um, a lot of good comments from Sam, thanks. And a lot of nice comments thanking the presenters. Uh, I think that, is, that, that about sums it up for the questions. I'm sorry if I missed your question, but you can email me if you have further questions. There was a good one that I saw, which is um, how do you reduce mice if you have uh, pet birds and can't eliminate food access? Oh. Or if it, that's impossible. So I'm sure that's a common question too. It is, but it depends on the way that the, the food is actually held. So there's things that you can do to actually deal with pet food, um, such as keeping the pet food that's not out and available to the pet in some type of a Tupperware container. Uh, the other thing is to clean the pet food dishes on a regular basis. And if they kick it out, especially birds, they have that tendency to kind of kick the food out all over the place, making sure that you're routinely cleaning out whatever, cleaning up whatever it is that they, they've kicked out. So, yeah, it's not an elimination of the food, but it's about managing the food in a way that you're enhancing sanitation. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed a couple of questions before we all wrap up. Um, can you go over the HVAC building design impact again? Sure, sure. That was a little complicated. So um, the two buildings that I was referring to in that one of them had a forced hot air duct system. So two registered hot air, hot air out, register back. Um, and ducts are enclosed. They're actually tied in and pretty well sealed into the wall. They actually run through the wall voids. For the most part, they're sealed relatively well. It's not like mice can't get into them, but it's not like, uh, say, a baseboard heating system where you actually have a pipe that actually holds hot water and it goes directly through the wall. And we've all seen the baseboard heating pipes that kind of go through the wall. They're never sealed really well. So it basically just allows a channel access for mice to run from one apartment to the next apartment to the next apartment. In other words, you might as well just knock down the walls because the mice can run from one area straight on through the other because those pipes are usually shared. So in one case, we have an enclosed uh, system that's actually in void space and tightly sealed into the living areas from one apartment to the next. The other one is just basically opens up a breezeway for mice to be able to traverse from one apartment to the next. In the one where you actually, the baseboard heater, where you had that traverse type of uh, open access, um, we actually saw a lot more feeding on the bait stations that we had placed next to the HVAC systems. On the ones where the duct system was in the wall, tightly sealed, we didn't have that much feeding on those bait stations that were near those ducts. So it, it, again, it's not one is better than the other. It's, it's understanding the construction a little bit will allow you to think about the way the mice are actually moving through the building. Okay, a couple more, sorry. People are now starting to type. Um, Nancy, hi, Nancy. Um, Nancy asks, if one site uses exclusion to control mice, it seems like a neighbor who does not use exclusion may be prone to a new infestation based on the movement of scouts. And that's why I think we're making the argument for uh, the building management should be doing the exclusion. So there's a, there's a couple pieces. There's outer envelope and inner envelope is what I always refer to it as. And, and Bobby and I have kind of talked about this quite a bit. The outer envelope is the exterior walls, your perimeter walls. And that is the most important part for exclusion. The inner envelope is all of the walls that actually separate out spaces within the building. Once you have mice in, the inner envelope becomes really important in understanding the way that mice are traversing from one area of the building to another area of the building is really important and, and critical. So from, for, from that standpoint, that comment is absolutely right. However, the outer exclusion is the piece that actually keeps novel infestations from coming in. So all the activity that you're doing to manage the mice inside the building, it, if the outer envelope is not sealed relatively well, it's for naught because you're gonna constantly be getting new mice coming in if there's a, 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 a population on the exterior of the building. So it's both are, are actually critically important. Thanks. Uh, hi, Don. Don asks a uh, uh, pretty complicated question, but if there's a 
simple answer. Uh, he says, in your opinion, why are university researchers more successful in controlling pests than professional pest managers? And that's a depends, I, I, would, I would say. <laughs> I'm both. And the one thing that I could tell you is uh, <laughs> when, when it comes to doing research, you do have more time to dedicate to uh, what you're doing because you're actually really interested in getting the details and the data so that you can actually do analysis on, on what you're doing. Whereas um, in the pest control industry, it, time is, is um, you know, you're going from one stop to the next stop to the next stop. And, and um, so you got contractual bounds, especially in, in public housing. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of issues with uh, the way that those contracts are, are kind of set up and what resources um, are, are allocated to actually controlling the problem within those contract bounds. So there's, there's a couple different pieces that actually limit on the pest control side. Whereas as a researcher, you, you don't have those limitations. Does that sound uh, fair, Chang Lu? Yeah, I wanna add that uh... In our 2009 study at uh, Indiana, uh, we hired uh, Orkin Pest Control to uh, do the community-wide cargo control. So what they uh, did at the beginning is uh, they would go to every apartment and then like more than 200 apartments and spend two days, two staff. Um, that's why you know they didn't get a good control. But what I did is uh, I, I put the monitors and get the list of apartments that are with cockroaches and ask them only go to the ones with roaches. So basically each month they only go to 40, I think 40 to 50 apartments. Therefore, so 40 to 50 apartments in two days, two staff, they can spend a very good amount of time and get uh, the cockroach control. That's why at the end of the experiment, both uh, the researcher delivered IPM and the contractor delivered IPM had the same results, but their control was slower because at the beginning, they, you know, they went, visited every apartment every month. So that's not really enough time. And many apartments didn't have roaches. Yeah, so I, I could tell you that being in the industry, um, the industry is very capable of solving almost any problem. Um, that, that, that it comes across if it has the time and the resources to allocate right. to it. So, I think so. So as long as they have the time and uh, you know, resources, they can do your effective control. So that's why how to set up the control policy, um, you know, that's very important to be able to uh, deliver the effective control. Okay, um, sorry, I'm typing as we go. Um, some people have asked where they can get a certificate of completion. I don't put the certificate up until the webinar is over. So revisit that website that I uh, put in the chat that's stoppest.org slash go slash IPM update. Um, I think we covered most of the questions. One last question I can't find again was if you see one dead roach, does that mean you have an infestation? I think you guys can answer that pretty quickly. Uh, I would suggest uh, that uh, place, uh, you know, at least uh, four to six monitors and uh, watch for a few weeks. That, that will confirm. Okay. I think that wraps it up. Great. Lovely. There's lots of wonderful questions, people. Thank you very, very much for your thoughtful questions. And uh, this was a fascinating presentation. So I want to uh, share a couple of things before we end. Um, if you are wanting to um, work with people in the Northeast on an aspect of IPM, and I know um, Chang Lu is on this list, we have a website for finding colleagues um, that you, uh, who are working in your area so that you can cooperate, uh, collaborate with them. So you'll find the link here to the site and then also where you can put a profile yourself. Um, the recording is going to be available in about a week. You can watch it as often as you like. Um, and there will be um, a version of the uh, slides um, available too. And um, we want to uh, end by acknowledging our funders, um, USDA NIFA and, um, and HUD, uh, who fund the Northeastern IPM Center and the Stop Pests in Housing. None of this would be possible without your tax dollars and, uh, 
and uh, NIFA, uh, part of USDA, uh, to give funding for, for, for our work and, and for Chang Lu and Shannon's research that uh, funded part of this. And um, I, I want to end by just saying thank you very, very much to uh, Shannon and Chang Lu for the hours and hours and hours of work that has gone into this one hour presentation, <laughs> uh, just in terms of education and expertise and long hours doing the research and, and pulling together the data. And uh, so thank you very much for your dedication and your expertise and your commitment to finding out answers that are applicable and helpful to people. And uh, I'm sure Susanna and I both uh, say thank you very much for joining us and uh, look forward for more information. And please go to the Stop Pest uh, in Housing website for much more information that um, Susanna has posted there. And is there anything else you want to say before we end, Susanna? Um, no, thank All you right. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There we go. We'll end with that. Thank so, you. All right. Thank you for organizing the seminar. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.